Hi, everyone, and welcome to our talk on power simulations for cognitive studies. My name is Erin Buchanan, and I'll be presenting work today that was supported by my colleagues Katie, Nick, Jack, and Maria. There's a long-standing tradition in the cognitive sciences to use controlled stimuli in our experimental studies. For example, the Snodgrass and Vanderwart line drawings have been cited over 6,000 times and are a very common set of stimuli for picture naming studies. The current lens on replication and reproducibility has increased the focus on our method and materials used in studies. Recently, Katie, Nick, and I published an annotated bibliography of the stimuli sets and linguistic norms, and we found that there has been a rapid increase in the publication rates of norm data sets, especially in behavior research methods. While it's very exciting that these data are available, we have to stop and consider the implications of publication of reliable validated data. Normally, when we power our studies, we focus on the desired sample size to achieve a specific power probability. This sample size planning is driven by the research design, the choice of hypothesis test, and the effect size estimation. Stimuli norming has nearly none of these parameters. Often, the choice is to meet some minimum or well-established criteria like n equals 30. The issue of power and sample size planning has been mostly ignored for norms data collection. Here I'll discuss how one might plan sample sizes for qualitative data collection, such as the semantic, feature, semantic property task and quantitative data collection. Further, power increases in complexity for cognitive designs with many items and the use of multi-level models. And the ideas in this presentation can be used even when you have a specific hypothesis test in mind. First, power in qualitative studies is often called coverage or saturation, and this term denotes adequate sampling and that further sampling is unnecessary. In the semantic property listing task, you might ask a participant, what is a zebra? And they would list options like has stripes, is a horse, and is mean. Over many participants, this qualitative data is summed for feature frequency. I want to highlight this new great paper by Canessa and colleagues that covers how to estimate the necessary sample size for these types of studies. First, you define a minimum coverage criteria in percentages. Then you sample a small number of participants to estimate the coverage space initially. Given this current coverage space, you can then estimate the remaining sample size for your desired coverage. You'd repeat this process until the coverage sizes for each item have been met. The procedure for quantitative studies is remarkably center, similar if we use accuracy in parameter estimation. In APE, the focus shifts away from p-values and hypothesis testing to calculating the desired sample size to accurately measure a parameter by providing a sufficiently narrow confidence interval. For this process, you would define a minimum acceptable sample size, define a stopping rule, and finally define a maximum sample size. I'm going to demonstrate a simulation example specifically for a study with no hypothesis testing. However, you can find articles on how to estimate sample size by checking out work by Ken Kelly. Let's look at an example of a study that uses word response latencies. You can use your own previous data for these types of simulations, or in this case, I'm going to use the English Lexicon Project, which is a norm data set with lexical decision and naming response latencies for many words. This data provides a good metric for the variability in simple response latencies. Because we know that participants have a somewhat arbitrary base response latency, these first have been z-scored by participant data collection session. I've also filtered to only examine correct answers for real words. First, let's figure out a stopping rule for data collection. What should a sufficiently narrow confidence interval be in a response latency study? What parameter do I accurately want to measure? Since I don't have a hypothesis test in mind for my study, I will use the response latency as my parameter and define a sufficiently narrow by standard error which controls the actual width of a confidence interval. I could, however, define this with a hypothesis test in mind 
saying I wanted the confidence interval of Cohen's D to be approximately 0.2 on each size side of the final effect size. So what is the average standard error of a response latency for real English words? As we look at the graph here of each item standard error, I'll note the average sample size for each word is currently 27. There's a lot of variability in response latency variance and the average standard error is approximately 0.16. If I assume these data are representative of my potential stimuli list, what sample size should I expect to meet that standard error? I randomly selected 100 words from the larger set, sampled with replacement to achieve sample sizes of 5, 10, 15, 20, up to 200. So while the real data averages approximately 30 participants per word, I can simulate larger sample sizes for testing. This graph indicates that small samples are pretty variable, while larger samples show the expected decrease in variance. Given the simulations, what should the sample size be? At n equals 25, we found that 80% of our samples would meet the standard error criteria, and we would need to increase that sample size to 50 to find that 95% of standard sampled words meet our criteria. Therefore, we can define our minimum sample size and I've selected 35 to meet our confidence interval goals. Note, this isn't too far off from the original study. I would also want to define a maximum sample size, and this estimate is based on time, money, effort for the study, and we've selected 300 participants because we know we can afford to. Now what? I have a minimum, maximum, and a stopping rule of 0.16. You should pre-register these plans. Next, collect data for the minimum sample size. With this data, you can calculate your confidence interval or standard error as our proxy for confidence interval. Did you meet your criteria? If so, then you can stop. If you do not, continue collection and repeat until you've met your criteria or you've reached the maximum sample size. You can calculate after each participant or after a set of participants, depending on your time and code skills. Here are some other considerations that are possible for this type of targeted sample size procedure. You could consider using an adaptive design that probabilistically samples stimuli based on their potential variability. In our study, we are planning a thousand stimuli and participants will only see a subset of these. However, we do not wish to bias participants by only showing them the weird words at the end so we can use the previous variability to help us evenly spread stimuli across participants. Since this procedure focuses on accurately estimating items, I also recommend pairing that with hypothesis tests, when appropriate, that consider and control for items, like multi-level models. Reisbart and Steven have an excellent paper on these designs and their power considerations as well. Last, I've mentioned this work is in preparation for a new study, which is the SPAM-L, or Semantic Priming Across Many Languages. And that study is in partnership with the Psychological Science Accelerator. The PSA is a global network of research labs who partner together to engage in worldwide research. This project's lofty goals include providing a large multilinguistic normed data set for computational analysis, code packages for accessing and interacting with the data, and more. If you're interested in joining this project, including three pre-projects that are currently ongoing, please contact me. We're looking for collaborators for all parts of the project. Now, I'm happy to answer your questions and thanks for your attention.